The Power Factor Show with Rick, Steve, and Kayla. Episode 90. You can find this podcast and others at Gun Rights Radio Network, gunrightsradio.com, podcasting freedom. Brought to you by Safariland and Hodgton, the gunpowder people. Welcome to Power Factor. I'm Rick. I'm Larry. And tonight's episode is kind of a combo episode of mechanical and physical things that you can do for recoil reduction. And we've got uh, kind of the physical, and that is uh, your grip, the manner in which you grip the gun, uh, grip strength. And then we've got uh, modifications that you can make to your gun, which generally amounts to adding weight. Uh, to try to reduce recoil, and then we'll get into uh, compensators because, of course, you know that's probably the, on a handgun the way to uh, best attenuate recoil. But then very limited applications once you've got right. your compensator on there. Right. So uh, let's just start out with grip. Um, if you if you've watched earlier episodes, we demonstrate the popular uh, what most people refer to now as the Ipsit grip, right. and it's the two thumbs forward. Uh, if you want to go back and look at the grip stance draw episodes, um, it's just, you know, you're, you're essentially rotating right. the weak hand wrist forward uh, to allow your strong hand thumb to rest down on it. Um, all the successful shooters hold the gun that way. Uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, that wasn't the case. But now, you know, if you watch a video of an Ipsic match, whether it's nationals or a local club match, uh, everybody but the new guy is holding the gun that way. So, right. and, and it does uh, help reduce recoil. Um, uh, the, the whole grip and stance thing has evolved since the 70s. I mean, if you look at uh, back in the days when the sport was dominated by guys like Jeff Cooper and uh, Ray Chapman and those guys, right. they had a very different grip and they had their own ideas of you know why that was the way to hold the gun. But I think just over time, it's been proven that the modern isosceles or flexed isosceles or whatever you, name you want to call it, um, with the two thumbs forward grip has come to dominate with good reason. I've read some stuff, um, you know, like on the tactical side that says, uh, you know, you want your strong hand to really be doing most of the holding, um, you know, in case it's a gun grab situation or something like that. You have to right. fend somebody off with your weak hand. And there's some other arguments for, for different grip styles. Um, but I think if we're talking putting hits on target as quickly as possible without having to worry about somebody trying to take the gun from us, uh, the, the two thumbs forward is the way to go. And uh, the other aspect of that, and this is probably at least as important as the way we've got our hands configured on the gun, is you want that grip to be as high as possible. Um, if you think right. of the, uh, the grip of the gun as a lever, you want that lever to be as short as possible. So on this gun... We see the, the barrel is running over the top of the slide, and it's probably only maybe an inch right. above the top of the beaver tail. But if you're holding the gun like this, now it's an inch and a half above your wrist, and your wrist is, is, is the place that gonna, you're going to feel or see this uh, recoil effect. And so by getting your hand all the way up on the gun like right. that, I mean, if you can see on this side, my thumb is actually up uh, even with the bottom of the slide, and I sometimes actually have trouble. For a while, I had an issue with uh, cases bouncing off my thumb and back thumb, into the ejection yeah. port. And so you really, I, I, I can counter that just by keeping my thumb down like this rather than getting it up like that. But the higher you can get your grip on the gun, the better yeah. by lowering uh, the muzzle relative to your hand. And you'll find some guns... Um, like on a stock 1911 stock, meaning the old GI style, you can modify it with a beaver tail. Um, some guns, uh, they'll have add-on beaver tails, which really are more to fight hammer bite. But you'll see lots of modifications on this part of the gun to get that hand up as high as possible. Right. And so just up high, get the thumbs forward, and that's the way right. to go. Give the gun less leverage against your wrist. Now, when you started yeah. shooting, were you already shooting in that style, or did you I modify think, yeah, your grip I, over I time? Pretty much was, yeah. I I, I think it, it seemed natural to me, I think, uh, to do it that way. I think, you know, right in the beginning, I was cup and saucer when I was a kid. Right, you know? right. Uh, but that, that grip feels very natural. Yeah, and it does to me now. Yeah. When I started shooting uh, as a kid... Uh, I was a definite Jeff Cooper disciple, reading Cooper on yeah. handguns and Guns and Ammo magazine every month. And so I was the two thumbs up, um, 
holding the gun like this, this thumb yeah. hard down on the safety and my other thumb <laughs> locked down on top of it. And I shot like that, you know, right up until uh, the late 90s when I started, mid to late 90s when I started shooting USPSA. Then I kind of started looking around and I'm seeing, well, hell, nobody, nobody's holding the gun that way. Uh, so I switched the two thumbs forward and it felt very unnatural at first. And I think it was just the sense that you're, you're kind of trading some of the strong hand grip for more weak hand grip. And so I think it's sort of people try to quantify the grip. They'll even say, you know, like, oh, I put 40% of the the pressure on the gun with my strong hand and 60% with my weak hand. And, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to quantify it that way. But if you, if you use a grip like this, um, you'll probably be putting about 80% of your grip strength on there with your strong hand. And then your weak hand really is a weak hand. I mean, this is all you have to hold on to right here. And so it really isn't going to contribute much. If you get that thumb up then you can really get half or more of your grip strength um, high on the gun. Again, if you're holding it like this, your weak hand's down like this. If you open it up and you get the weak hand up high on the gun. And that's really, the, you know, in terms of recoil reduction, uh, what you can do with your stock gun is just use the best possible grip on it. Now, you will also notice that this gun has some enhancements uh to help hold on to it. And it's not really recoil re- reduction per se, but it keeps the gun from squirming around in your hand. And you don't have to clamp down quite as hard. Exactly. Now, we you don't have uh, to fight we're, quite as hard. We were talking about stippling on right. your gun and show what we got here, completely surrounding the, yep. the entire surface of the Full grip. circumference uh, stippling. It's melted into the plastic frame and it gives a uh, just a good traction. I don't know how to, to describe it. It's almost like sandpaper. Yeah, it feels yeah. a lot like skateboard tape, but it's right. permanent. I mean, it's just yeah. molded right into the or sure. cut into the melted into right. or whatever into the surface. Melted in. Yeah. Now, in your 1911, you can do the. Uh, this gun has the checkered back strap, checkered front strap, and then these uh, heavily checkered uh, aluminum grips. And so it is pretty much non-slip. You're not going to have much uh, slippage there anywhere. And some people will checker, you know, the bottom of the trigger guard and various other things. But if you've got, um, I usually think of my strong hand as really squeezing front to rear and my weak hand squeezing side to side. I mean, once I've got the grip on it. And so if you've got uh, checkering or other traction enhancement on all four sides or all the way around, um, that's the best you're going to be able to do to keep the gun solid in your grip and keep it from squirming around. Now, once you've got your grip and your uh, external enhancements, then there's some things you can do uh, to the gun to reduce the recoil, either felt recoil or to actually reduce the recoil energy. I I kind of flubbed it. Uh, Somebody sent a question about bullet weight and load data, and uh, my reply to the question was that for a given power factor, the recoil energy was the same. And you were smart enough to come up with, (laughs) no, it's not. That's not the same. And so uh, so let's go into that, the actual reduction of recoil as opposed to perceived reduction of recoil. Yeah, I don't expect it's a physics lesson, but just the idea that that by changing bullet weight, you actually can reduce uh, recoil energy. Right, so recoil energy, I guess, we explain is it is kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy... Is, is dependent on the mass of the bullet and also the velocity of the bullet. And it's um, um, kinetic energy equals one-half mv squared. Uh, Steve's not here, but I'm an engineer. This is the engineer seat. We'll, so. call, we'll call him later and see if that's right. <laughs> yeah. So one-half mv squared. So m being the mass of the bullet, v being the velocity, but you notice it's squared. So if we can, you can make power factor with a heavy bullet going slow or a light bullet going fast. But if we can reduce that velocity component of our power factor, mass times velocity, we can, we can affect the recoil. And um, mathematically, it works out, and, uh, but there, are, there is a point of diminishing returns. Okay. Now, one of the things we, when we discuss it, it's generally been in terms of kind of a preference for the subjective recoil sure. as opposed to, you know, I want the least possible recoil. It's more like I want it to feel a certain way. Right. And in, gen- in general, the heavy bullet load for a given power factor will feel soft. People describe it as soft. Mm-hmm. And it often uh, results, depending, again, on, on some variables, results in a kind of a, can result in kind of a sluggish slide action. Right. There can be some, you know, so some negative effects if you get it too low. But then if you, say, took a lightweight bullet, light for its diameter, 
pumped up to really high velocity, it can get really harsh. I mean, you can sure. use different words to well, describe yeah, look it. At, look at some defensive loads, uh, you know, in the 40 caliber, which I'm, I'm mainly a 40 caliber guy, but if you're looking at some defensive loads in the 155 grain, they're pretty hot. Yeah. They feel very hot, or 165 grain, they feel very hot. And in fact, they, they've, I've chronoed some at 177 power factor. I mean, they're up there. Right. So, uh, yeah, so, and I find with the major power factor loads, that math works out pretty good. And you find a lot of people, let's talk 40 caliber, a lot of people shooting a 180 grain bullet. And why are they it's, shooting 200s? Some guy, they're always going to say there's, there's a few guys out there shooting 200s. But again, we're getting into the, into the realm where it's, starting to where you're when you get good enough you're waiting on the gun and um that slide is not coming back fast enough and it's not it's just not cycling fast enough for right. for so, some guys some guys like it some guys have um especially if you have um wrist or elbow like tennis elbow type injuries or carpal tunnel that math works out really good for you uh to reduce the actual energy coming back into your arm mm -hmm. so Okay, and now the other another interesting thing is uh, recoil springs. Yes. I've heard people describe shooting a gun with a really heavy recoil spring mm -hmm. as shooting really soft. But to me, it's like shooting a pogo stick. I mean, the the <laughs> the the, the, sure. the slide action is is kind of almost hard to control. If I were just shooting single shots and all I was concentrating on was just how does the Accuracy. you know does the gun feel yeah. good? Maybe I'd prefer that. But when you're shooting uh, trying to shoot with speed and accuracy, right. I tend to go the exact opposite way and use the lightest recoil spring that the gun seems to want to run with. With your 45, what what recoil spring is? I, I'm using a 14 uh, pound in my gun because that particular gun, I still have some sense that in a pinch it could be a weapon. And so I would still want to be able to fire full power gotcha. defense loads out of it. Mm -hmm. But if I had a gun that, if, if it were just good, a dedicated uh, competition gun, I'd probably have an 11 pound spring in it. Oh, wow. That's light. That's yeah. very light. And, and I know guys who, that's, that's their, that's, they consider that the modification for a competition gun. You take out the 16 pound spring, put an 11 pound spring in, now I'm ready to go. You know? Yeah, I was running 11 pound also in an uh, in, uh, STI limited gun with 40 caliber. And, 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 how do you, and, and what's your subjective sense about changing the spring? Uh, you know, I've, I tried, um, I tried, I, you know, the gun, the gun came with a 12. I tried an 11. Yeah, that's about, it was about right. So, yeah. it, was so kinda, you, it was kind of right from the get go. Five use, inch gun had a 12, 12 and a half pound spring in it. Um, a six inch gun, I was using an 11. Now, did you use shock buffs? Um, off and on, not, sh you know, wasn't sure if I was doing myself any favors or anything okay. with or without. I experimented. Um, Were you experimenting then with a the sense of how the gun feels, as opposed to I don't want my gun to fall apart from use, or yeah, more of a more of a uh, to save the gun from any battering, especially with the uh, with an eleven pound spring, right, right, and a major power, right. So. Okay, so now we've got our uh, uh, we've reduced our actual measured recoil with our load. We've uh, altered the sense that we subjective sense of how we experience the recoil uh, with our spring. Now we can go into maybe kind of the mechanical uh, things, or sure. weight is what it comes down to. When sure. I say mechanical, it's going to be weight. And uh, now there's there's more uh, there's more issues here other beyond just what I like, what's fun, because some of the competitive divisions uh, in both IDPA and USPSA have weight limits, sure. and sometimes those weight limits are fairly easily reached, and sometimes uh, I don't think you have to worry about it too much. But for instance, this is about as heavy a gun as you're going to see in uh, either USPSA single stack or IDPA custom defensive pistol. Uh, the weight limit's 43 ounces, I think, 43 ounces in uh, single stack and 42 ounces in CDP. And if you, uh, if you have a gun that's all steel, and by that I mean not just a slide in the frame, but we've got uh, a steel mainspring housing, a steel magwell, a full-length steel guide rod, and then this big old light rail on here, the gun is probably or almost certainly going to be too heavy. It's going to weigh 45 ounces or something. And so you have to kind of pick your poison to decide um, where do I want to put that where weight. Come off. And so on this gun, for instance, I think it's got the plastic, the original plastic mainspring housing on it from Kimber. And it's got this giant, if you need to change the oil on your car, you can take the slide off and use this. <laughs> um, it's got the yeah. short GI guide rod. So we've got the weight, add, a little bit of weight added in the form of the magwell 
um, compared to a lot of guns, a little weight subtracted in the form of the short GI guide rod. And so those two together, uh, I think this is probably aluminum, this magwell, so it's not adding much right. weight at all. So right. we've got plastic, aluminum, short guide rod. That's going to balance the extra weight of the uh, light rail on here. But the light rail is really where you want. I mean, I think where most sure. people want the extra weight. You don't really necessarily want to add weight in the reciprocating part of the gun. Right. You don't want a heavy slide. Um, there was a time when people were using like the long dust covers and the full profile slides, and that was yes. all the rage. And then you started seeing people drill holes in their slides yeah. to lighten them. And so there's, there's a, you know, it's not static. There's, there's a lot of, sure. you know, different kind of trends and fads. Six inch guns were popular for a while, not so much. I don't think uh, now. Oh, as come they on, were. yeah, they are. Are they? Oh yeah. Are they really? Oh yeah. They're 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 popular. Okay. So I still like them. So hey. Well yeah, I still like mine too when I sh- when I get around to shooting it. But anyway, so, so well uh, I'm talking double stack. Oh well. So I know you've got yeah, your okay. six inch single stack. Exactly. So. so um so anyway, so. so we've got our weight in this gun distributed out here. The extra weight beyond what we'd find in a normal yeah. 1911 is out here on the end in the form of this. Uh, Right. Uh, light rail. Put some counterweight up front. Right. And and that you put it right underneath the barrel, out front where it's gonna do the most good. And and maybe we should we should uh, explain the difference between recoil and muzzle flip. Oh sure, so, yeah. yeah. Some I mean, people think of them so, as kind of uh, interchangeable. Right. Yeah, and they're not. I mean, for instance I, I'll hear a lot of people talk about uh, like a small lightweight gun, there will be a ton of recoil, but not much muzzle flip because the slide only weighs a couple ounces. I mean, you, you get the slide, like my three and a half inch right. 45 compared to this, the slide probably weighs only about two thirds as much. So when I shoot it, right. I get a nice big heavy pushback in terms of recoil, but very little muzzle flip because right. the slide's light when it's coming back and it's light when it's going forward. So do you have any, like a specific kind of scientific uh, Definition of muzzle flip for us? Not really. You can't like no, cite no. A, an equation or something. I'm sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But we can say what, what, how we can okay. affect it. Okay. Let's ha- let's know. go there then. Let's go there. Okay. And, and now the same same thing applies to a plastic gun like a Glock. And how do we get weight up front? Well, we can't really by the rules we can't hang a weight up here up front or anything like that. And we can't you know put any lead sinkers up front. We've got um, a popular item here is a tungsten guide rod. Which tungsten steel is much much heavier. It's probably oh I don't know I don't know the exact number two two or three times heavier than, than regular steel, and this is extended in length much longer than it would have to be to actually function in the gun, but it gets weight up front, which you know counteracts that muzzle rise. Um, you know and we talked about you know, bore axis height. Glocks are known for have a real low bore axis, which was which is nice. They have much less leverage on your wrist. You get some weight up front here is nice. Uh, but in general, I like a light gun, and um, it seems to work for me. I like it. I like it faster. Now, in limited, cycle. open, limited ten, single stack. Uh, as long as the in the divisions that have weight limits, you can put the the metal guide rod on there. But in production, what's the rule there? Right. Okay. So production with a production gun. Do we have a production gun here? Uh, uh, kind of. This is. It's not configured for production gun use, but. That's a production gun. Right. Okay. So we have this Smith & Wesson M&P. Let's imagine the light, the flashlight's not on here. Uh, this is otherwise a production gun. Now, the, the, the rules for production is it has to weigh within two ounces of factory spec. Um, and there's, there's things you can do to your gun that are legal modifications. For one thing, you can change sights. And when you go from a, from a factory, let's say, Glock plastic, plastic sight, sight, exactly, mm-hmm. and you throw a Dawson sight on there... I don't know what they weigh, but I mean, you're over half an ounce easy, or maybe sure. even getting close to an ounce right. once you replace both front and rear sights with metal sights. But anyway, that's uh, that's a weight limit issue, I guess. Not so much recoil control. But still, you, you know, that's one of the things when I say so, uh, you pick your poison. You know, where do you want your right. weight? Now, Is, do you want it up top on the slide, or you now, know? you know, if if we could find a picture of the Pelican gun, do you remember the Pelican? I, is that the one that the Italians this brought? This was uh, a Spanish gun, I, Spanish, I believe, okay. with the SPS. And um, they they produced a gun that was called the Pelican, which the frame, which I had a, 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 a STI here to show you, but the frame was a full-length dust cover, five-inch five inch barrel gun. But it had this integral one piece of metal, you know, the frame. And it looked like dipped, half a barbell. It dipped down. Yeah, I don't know, at least an inch or inch yeah, and a half. It, it, I mean, it was probably three times as massive as this now, just hanging down here. 
The only thing I see, and everyone cried foul at the national. Or was it the nationals or the? Uh, I want to say it was a world, world shoot. shoot I think. Yeah. Probably it was five, six, eight years ago. Yeah. It was a while ago. Yeah, now, I think. yeah, probably eight years ago. Everyone cried foul, but you know, in the end, what are you swinging around? You're transitioning from target to target. This massive weight that's hanging out there. So, yeah. there's a point where. You know, we need to get realistic about how much weight you really want out front right. counteracting this muzzle flip. Right. I mean, your your slide is never going to cycle perfectly like this, you know, without any kind of flip. So you right. just need to learn to control that through grip like we were talking about. So. Yeah, yeah. And then this is an example of extra weight that's been added on the gun that I don't think uh, you're going to be able to shoot any competition with that. You can um, shoot open division with oh, that. Oh, there you go. Exactly. Yeah. If and, you can, and, and anything, you, know, you can shoot just about darn near anything. Pretty, pretty and open. much what they say. If you can drag it to the line, it's good to go. But for instance, in USPSA, light, no lights so. are legal. Um, but if you're just looking, um, you know, for an improvement in your uh, recoil control, it is a little bit of extra weight added right out here right. where your tungsten guide rod would be. Um, so you know, and it helps you find those targets in the dark house. Yeah, which the tungsten guide rod doesn't. So <laughs> right. not much anyway. Right. So. Oh. Wow, yeah, it works. works. Look yeah, at that. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So anyway, so so again, you've got your uh, your grip, your stippling traction. You've got your uh, load development. We've got our recoil springs, our tungsten guide rods. Uh, what else? So is what there? about weight reduction? You know, we we kick this off with adding weight to the gun, but what about weight reduction for recoil control? And um, I will say that we kind of touched on it a little bit there, but yeah. reducing weight from the reciprocating part of the gun, which is going to be your slide mainly, with the complete slide, with, you know, your sights and everything else attached to it. Um, in a bushing 1911, you've got the bushing. Uh, or rather the spring plug well the bushing itself it also adds a little bit of weight yep. there's not really a lot you can do about that yeah. uh, you want that bushing to be strong so you're not going to cut weight from that little part right. but although you could add a bull barrel if you wanted to remove the weight of the there's, bushing well there's another but then the barrel itself when it comes back that short bit of travel that it has quarter inch of travel it's, it would contribute something to the recoil a little bit yeah but in general people feel that that's a good way to get weight out front yeah. again it's a yeah. bull barrel exactly and if you want to go even beyond that a uh, infinity schumann style uh ribbed barrel what, what they call sight the tracker? sight tracker right um well of course I, now then you're going to start being able to nail it to add the weight at the end of the barrel in limited and, and uh, yeah we can talk about that also that'll be a good episode talk about <laughs> the rule change oh i can't wait so um, notice now this is a factory Glock slide and notice we've got a big, you know, there's a cutout here and that's to reduce the weight some because there's a point when you get battered by this reciprocating slide, um, if your recoil spring is light enough, it comes back and it when, it, when it comes to its full travel, it hits you and that gives you a jolt of muzzle flip, a little bit back in your hand, but I mean, it's nothing that's, you know, unreasonable, but then the, the counterpoint to that is when the slide closes, you'll get a muzzle dip if that slide is too heavy. And we've seen a, oh gosh, over the at least five, six years, a, a insurgence of popularity with the six inch uh, STI double stack limited gun and with it lightweight. And there's a lot of gunsmiths out there, JPL being one of my favorite, that makes a great gun. And you lighten that slide, you get uh, you know, you get get the weight out of it, so it just is like a sewing machine. Yeah, I mean that's my six inch gun. Has, this one's not quite there. My six inch uh, 1911 has like five fairly large holes drilled on each side, and so even though the slide's an inch longer, it weighs about the same as a standard five inch slide. So I've got the extra inch of barrel, and it's also a bull barrel. So I've probably got a couple of ounces of extra weight in the barrel. But then removing a little weight from the slide keeps the slide velocity up, and right, and exactly. you're not getting uh, you're not getting battered in either direction. And I you know you I find that the gun I, I like the light slide. I mean I think the light slide is unless it's going to be a durability issue. Um, I think it's kind of a win win. Uh, you you get the slide is faster, and I think uh, you don't have to worry about the muzzle dip like you do with a heavy slide or a heavy recoil spring. And and really I mean in the end it's all about personal preference and your as your skills build and your equipment changes, you know, we like equipment, everybody likes to get new guns and stuff and try different things and see if this works and will this make me a better shooter or whatever. Right. You kind of just have to go through the journey and, you know, yeah. throw, the math is nice, you toss it aside and just kind of keep it in your back pocket, but 
it's it's kind of all about the journey to figure out what works for your style. Right. Like, you know, talking about limited guns that I've had in the past, I went from a 44 ounce 5 inch sight tracker gun to a 37 ounce 6 inch gun, an extra right. inch of barrel. Right. But uh, much, much lighter weight, and uh, it worked out a heck of a lot better for me, uh, just my personal style. Now, what do you do about this? This is kind of contrary to everything we've been talking about because these grips lower your hand relative yep. to the bore by about a half an inch. Right. And one of the problems with the revolver is if you look at the classic revolver, the small revolver grips that conform to the shape of the frame, there's no filler behind the trigger guard here. And so what you sort of end up with is your trigger finger is, instead of being in line like it is in a normal grip or on a, a most automatic pistols, you almost get your trigger finger down below yeah. your second finger. And so by putting this filler back here, it realigns your fingers in that now your, your trigger finger is above your second finger, but again at the cost of uh, lowering your hand relative to the barrel here by another half an inch. And as you can see, it's already about three or four times uh, what it sure. is on that Glock. I mean, and, and really, uh, I think people fiddle around with different grips. Um, these are uh, uh, Hogue um, pebble finished, uh, kind of a hard rubber, and they're pretty comfortable. Um, it looks like the the it had uh, finger grooves on them, but the finger grooves never match anybody's hand. So a lot of people grind them off. I have some Pockmeyers at home. I did exactly the same thing, ground them off because I could get almost two fingers in between uh, each of the yeah. uh, grooves. But Mostly what people are doing with their revolvers is um, using a grip shape and material that's comfortable. They leave this filler in, even though in terms of kind of ultimate, uh, you know, kind of the, the physics of the thing, it's counterproductive. Um, getting your hand in this, in this position uh, with the trigger finger, you know, properly located relative to their fingers, I think is, is you know, it just helps your trigger action, and that's going to be more important. Also, uh, your grip on your revolver helps. And again, we're back to, you know, this, this is a popular revolver grip for the strong hand. Uh, rich and famous revolver shooters hold the revolver this way. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to suggest that they change. But as a primarily an automatic pistol shooter, um, I try to hold the revolver the same way as I do an automatic pistol and get my hands as high on the gun as possible. And I've, I've seen uh, in the revolver episode we did months and months ago, Caleb demonstrated a grip that's almost identical uh, right. to an auto pistol grip with the two thumbs forward. Well, you'll notice where as, my thumb is. As long as you don't get your thumb under that forcing Yeah, uh, you get your thumb out here in front of the cylinder and you might lose the end of it. Um, and so what I do is I bring this thumb up like this. And for me, I've got the hammer... Um, when it comes back, kind of nipping at the top of my hand, and uh, that is my revolver grip, and I've gotten some interesting commentary on it. But for me, that's the, that's as cl that's the highest kind of semi-auto-ish grip I can get on the gun uh, without losing the tip of my thumb. And yeah. it's just a matter of, you know, you do what you got to do. And, of course, this is an end frame. This is the largest uh, frame gun you're likely to see, but you see this all over the place in pistol competition because of the clip loading. And uh, if you get a Smith & Wesson L frame, which has a smaller diameter cylinder, right. or a K frame and even smaller diameter cylinder, yeah. that brings the bore line down, down lower in the gun. This large cylinder um, is what puts the barrel up so high, but of course you couldn't fit 645 rounds in it if it weren't that big. Right. So this is a fun gun. Uh, just, you know, on your recoil control, I think it's the same kind of thing. You want to get your hand up here. You know, you don't want to hold the gun down like this. Because again, you're just increasing and this leverage. lever length. Yeah. Get your hand all the way up on here and uh, go to town. Okay, uh, another recoil reducing feature you find on uh, on uh, competition guns is a compensator that is threaded onto the end of the barrel, which is a um, it's a series of uh, chambers that the bullet passes through a hole that's tight to the bullet, not too tight, but the gases behind it hit the baffles and eject upwards, which have an opposite reaction of putting the muzzle down, and, uh, and also you know, and also the gases also hit that baffle. They yank the gun forward, and when they eject, the muzzle comes down. And there's a um, a, a great recoil compensating effect. That's what they call a compensator, right? Hmm. Uh, to uh, um, which reduces your muzzle flip, 
and get you back on target faster. And that's why Open Division and USPSA, and these are not allowed in IDPA, is that correct? Not at all. So no compensators in IDPA, but in USPSA, the Open Division is known as the, the, the drag race division. Uh, the, the guns are highly tuned, and, and by reducing that muzzle flip with the compensator at the end of the barrel, uh, you're, you're on target for your follow-up shot very, very fast. Um, there's other things you can do like uh, uh, drilling holes in the barrel even behind the compensator to uh, re- you know, e- get even more gas ejecting upward, further reducing your muzzle flip. I think those are kind of falling by the wayside though and, and compensators are getting very, very efficient these days. And um, uh, that, that, that's, that's the way I think a lot of guns are going. So now in the 1911 style pistol, are we seeing the compensators added to the end of a 5 inch barrel or are they cutting the barrel back and the whole package is 5 inches long or yeah, how you know, is that for, working? I, th- I think for a long time the, uh, well let's just, I, I think 5.5 inch is, is common these days so you get a full 5 inch slide you got this extra half inch to thread on a compensator. Right. Um, another way is to have what they call a cone compensator, and you take a five inch, a regular five inch gun, and you cut the. Now John Larson can really explain this, but and I've and I've seen him do it, and you cut off just a bit of the slide to give room for the compensator, and in and you full length or nearly full length thread the barrel. And there's a lot of threads, and you thread that compensator on, and that so the comp's got and the that cone comp on it. has a cone which acts as your bushing to lock up tight to the slide. Okay, um, it almost has a profile like a bull barrel, really. Right. And once that's threaded on there, at one time there was a guy who was milling the barrel and the comp out of a single block of metal. Well, STI does that out of their factory guns. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So okay. any, any any factory STI gun you get uh, is one piece. Uh, Milled, yeah, like you say, it's 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 as if they were milling a barrel, and they you know they leave a block at the end, they mill some holes out of it, and, and that's your compensator. And now the comp design, the the design configuration, number of the ports, that's all proprietary. I mean, you buy a comp from one yeah, guy, it's yeah. going to be different from somebody else's. Yeah, everybody's got a different, a lot of different designs. There's a lot of different theories out there. You've got literally rocket scientists designing these things, and right. aerospace engineers designing these things, and you'll find. Commonly, three ports, four ports. That's how many chambers are facing upward. Uh, you'll see uh, the ports uh, drilled in the side to let gases outward. That's supposed to kind of stabilize the the optic dot, you know, and right. keep it centered and everything. And there's there's a, there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, in general, the the most popular calibers for these have been 38 Super, 38 Super Comp, um, as of Five years ago, with the rules changed, nine millimeters become very popular, and there's a lot of low data out there, a lot of tried and true stuff that, for for this length barrel, for that compensator from this manufacturer, here's a good load to start with, and you're and you're almost off to the races right from the get go. Now, are, are um, people uh, loading to 165 power factor, or are they no. pushing them harder than that to no. get more gas volume? Or? Yeah, well, I, well, first of all, just just have a safety factor, just have a cushion. To be sure, the match chronograph is uh, as accurate as yours is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, everyone loads a little hotter. Usually, you know, 169, 170. In any division, you want to be a little higher, just just in case. Uh, but are they doing it by choice but, in order to get a greater but compensating now, effect? Yes. Uh, there's. You'll see a lot of open guys shooting 175, 180 power factor. I think, um, and that more. More powder in the cartridge case gives you more gas volume, which is more to work that comp. And it's more gas ejecting upwards, more gas hitting the baffles to yank that gun forward and keep that muzzle down and get you back on target. So kind of counterintuitive, you run the gun hotter loads yeah, in order to get less hotter recoil. Hotter loads, less recoil. Now, a buddy of mine uh, was trying to turn his Glock 20, 10 millimeter, okay. into an open gun. Okay. And he had the comp on the end of a, screwed on it into the barrel, yeah. and he had to load over max loads in 10 millimeter which are max loads are hot loads they're very hot yeah over max the load and thing. he still was getting the cases just kind of dribbling out of the ejection port because the compensator was so effectively holding and the keep, gun keep, down and, keeping it locked and, and up and keeping it locked up right keeping yeah. that barrel locked up to the slide that it's just that much longer 
before the slide can unlock and retract and you've lost all that energy. So even though you're shooting so, yeah. an exceptionally hot load, you're right. using like a nine pound recoil spring, I was right? gonna say, yeah, and your, your recoil springs are very, very light because uh, yeah, it wouldn't cycle because you're losing all that energy. Yeah, so it shows just how effective yeah. they are. Because I mean, sure. if you're, I remember when I started shooting, the power factor was 175 and uh, as opposed to 165 that it is today for major. And uh, nine millimeter. Back when men were men. Back exactly. I think it had been 185 prior to that. I mean, that's when you know even the women were men. But uh, <laughs> um, the uh, nine millimeter, it, it had been determined that uh, the SAAMI specs for nine millimeter would not allow making major. So in the U.S., major nine was banned. Right. And so uh, in Europe, they continued to shoot it all along because they didn't have the kind of res restrictive. Uh, requirements that gun manufacturers in the U.S. willingly, you know, voluntarily go along with. But back in the day, you had these guys, uh, I was talking to a buddy who had shot open uh, back in the in the 80s and 90s, and he said you, they were driving, with a 38 Super, they were driving like 115 grain bullets at 1,600 feet per second, trying to make major, but then yeah. also packing as much powder into wow. the case yeah. as they could to get that pressure up. Sure. So you have all kinds of things you can do to your gun, mechanical, load-wise, right. uh, weight distribution and stuff. But really, you know, the thing you could probably, we always like a, an equipment solution. Right. I think people, you know, they want to buy right. a new widget. Throw, some, throw money at it. Yeah, get a new gun, you know, right. get that bull barrel to replace the bushing barrel. But really, uh, I think if you refine your technique, that's what's really going to be the most help. Right. Pick one and practice. Yeah. Get, so. that, get that good, solid, high grip on the gun and concentrate on your technique and your form and that's going to do the most good. It, once you've got that perfected, then you can go down the road of some of these other little mechanical tricks to try to fine tune that. But right. um, how you're holding on to the gun uh, is probably going to make the biggest difference. So of course you can go back to the episodes, uh, Power Factor episodes on grip and stance, and you'll be all set. So uh, that's about the end of it. So mm -hmm. until next time, if you want to send us an email, you'll be able to send that to powerfactorshow@gmail.com. You can contact the show at powerfactorshow.com or Facebook at facebook.com slash powerfactor. And until next time, sayonara.